Children's books are usually filled with fantastical characters going on amazing adventures, all to teach kids wonderful lessons about life. But sometimes, a classic kid story can strike you as really weird, or even a bit disturbing. Like fairy tales with super freaky origins and old cautionary stories that take punishments way too far. So are you still sitting comfortably? Because we're about to take a look at some of the darkest, weirdest, and most shocking children's tales that you won't believe are real. The Tomboy Who Changed Into a Real Boy For parents in the 1800s, nothing was more daunting than having a little girl who didn't want to act like a little girl. And it was this that led to the creation of Little Miss Consequence back in 1880. It's a book aimed at young girls filled with cautionary stories about bad manners, like the tomboy who changed into a real boy. And that title may seem pretty self-explanatory, but the story goes into some seriously disturbing details. It follows the daughter of an earl, who really doesn't want to act like a prim and proper young lady. So instead of learning boring embroidery, she goes off sledding, climbing trees, and playing football with the boys. And that doesn't exactly sound like a big issue, except, as punishment for her boyish actions, she mysteriously begins to look and sound like a boy. Her voice grows hoarse, her physique grows rougher, until one day she suddenly transforms into a real boy down in the pants department. Now, I'm no doctor, but I'm fairly certain that's not how this works, though the story doesn't end there. After the transformation, her mortified parents pay off a ship's captain to take her on as a sailor, and she's shipped off to sea, never to be heard from again. And this may have been written to try and stop girls acting like boys, but now it just reads like a tragic tale of bad parenting. Outside Over There Maurice Sendak was an author who was adored for writing and illustrating dreamlike children's books, such as Where the Wild Things Are and In the Night Kitchen. But his story outside over there was less like a dream and more like a nightmare. Ida, our young heroine, is left at home to watch her baby sister. But as she whimsically plays her horn, evil, faceless goblins sneak in and steal the baby, leaving a terrifying replacement made of ice in her cradle. And uh, if you thought the face of that thing was harrowing enough, believe me, it gets worse. Later, when Ida picks up the child, the icy infant horrifyingly melts through her fingers. Despite being traumatized, Ida bravely sets off to rescue her sister, and eventually carries her home again. I guess there's nothing like a classic baby-snatching story to lull a child to sleep. Rebecca, who slammed doors for fun and perished miserably. We've all slammed a door at least once in our lives, whether it's out of anger, frustration, or just to make someone jump. But according to Hilaire Belloc's Cautionary Tales for Children, which was published back in 1907, slamming a door could be the last thing you ever do. The poetic tale of Rebecca who slammed doors for fun and perished miserably is a title that horrendously doesn't leave much to the imagination. Rebecca was a spoilt child who enjoyed slamming doors to startle her uncle. But one day, she slammed a door that had a heavy metal marble bust above it. As you can guess, the bust fell, and as the story puts it, it laid her out, just like that. The tale then morbidly cuts to her funeral, where the pastor uses her tragic passing as a warning to all the kids who've turned up to mourn their friend. I mean, should we really be blaming the kid or the idiot who put that heavy marble bust above a door in the first place? Well, if you don't want to end up like Rebecca, instead of slamming doors, you should slam those like and subscribe buttons. I can guarantee that no matter how hard you slam them, no marble busts will drop on your head. Now, what weird story have we got next? The Little Mermaid The Little Mermaid that most kids know and love is Disney's adorable film adaptation made back in 1989. It follows the story of a young mermaid who falls in love with a human prince. Desperate to be with him, she leaves her family and makes a deal with an evil sea witch, trading her voice for a pair of human legs. 
Through trials and tribulations, the two eventually fall in love, get married, and live happily ever after. However, Disney left out a few key details from the original harrowing story it's based on, which was written by Danish children's author Hans Christian Andersen back in 1837. And for a start, before the mermaid trades her voice for her legs, she's warned that every single step she takes will be filled with pure agony. In fact, the book describes it brutally as like walking on knives. But that's not all. Even though the prince does fall in love with her, he's cruelly forced into an arranged marriage with another girl. Heartbroken and in constant pain, the mermaid's sisters then pop out of the water having traded all their hair with the witch for a magical knife. Can you guess what she has to do with the knife in order to break the spell? If you guessed assassinate the love of her life as he lays on his marriage bed, you're completely right. But she just can't bring herself to do it, and instead she throws herself into the ocean and inexplicably dissolves immediately into sea foam. So there's no true love, no happily ever after, just a cheap and efficient funeral. Maybe Hans Christian Andersen should have called this story, The Little Mermaid Learns Life Isn't Fair. The Little Match Girl Because writing one tragic story about a young girl meeting her end just wasn't enough for Hans Christian Andersen, he wrote another in the form of The Little Match Girl. It's about a child who's so poor, she sells matches to strangers in the street on a snowy New Year's Eve. But it's so cold, she begins to light them one by one to keep herself warm. In the glow of the flames, she suddenly experiences vivid hallucinations where she sees a big holiday feast, a Christmas tree, and even the face of her late grandma. Thoughtlessly, she begins burning all the matches to keep her grandma from fading away. And the next morning, strangers find the girl frozen in the street with a smile on her face. Wow, nothing like a bedtime story based on poverty and hypothermia to give your kids good dreams. Cinderella Cinderella is another well-loved Disney film about a princess who finds her prince with the help of talking animals, a flamboyant fairy godmother, and a pair of impossibly small feet. But the original story it's based on ain't no family-friendly fairy tale. You see, the Brothers Grimm first put the tale to paper back in 1812, under the name Aschenpudel. Like their name suggests, this German duo produced a variety of gritty fairy tales that were the opposite of Disney in almost every way. For a start, in Aschenpudel, there aren't any fairy godmothers going bibbidi-bibbidi-boo. Instead, the heroine has a magic tree that she's grown on her mother's grave by watering it with her tears. Now, the tree provides her with whatever she needs, but that's still insanely depressing, though it gets worse. In Disney's story, the prince tries to find Cinderella by having all the maidens in the land try on a shoe she left behind at the ball. However, Cinderella's cruel stepmother locks her away so one of her own two daughters might be chosen. Try as they might, the shoe doesn't fit, and Cinderella wins. But in Aschenpudel, this scene gets seriously gory. To make her foot fit in the tiny shoe, the first stepsister slices off her big toe, but upon seeing the mangled state of her foot, the prince realizes she's not the one. So the shoe is presented to the second stepsister, who cuts off her heel to make her foot fit. However, her ploy doesn't work either. Eventually, the small-footed Ashen Poodle slips on the shoe and rides off into the sunset with Prince Charming, but the brutality doesn't stop there. On Ashen Poodle's wedding day, the stepsisters fake their kindness towards her in order to get on the good side of the future princess. But as they're walking down the aisle, they have their eyes pecked out by angry pigeons for all their wickedness. Ooh, no wonder Disney made all those cuts. The Strange Feast The Brothers Grimm didn't just write strange stories about princesses. Although their tale of the strange feast is so odd that it'll definitely leave you scratching your head. In it, there are two sausages, one blood and one liver, who are friends. 
The blood sausage invites the liver sausage over for dinner, but when the liver sausage arrives, she sees some disturbing things on the stairs. Like a broom and shovel fighting, and an injured monkey. She asks the blood sausage what's going on, but he ignores her and goes to prepare their meal. Suddenly, the liver sausage hears a voice telling her she's in a trap and that she must escape. She flees quickly, but when she turns around, she sees the blood sausage with a sharp knife yelling, If I had caught you, I would have had you. As much of a trip as that story was, I'm not sure which part confused me more, the anthropomorphized sausages or the suggestion of sausage cannibalism. Struvelpeter You may think that the Brothers Grimm win the award for the most messed up kids' tales, but there's another German author who could easily claim that title. Heinrich Hoffmann was a physician who penned many moral tales for children back in the 19th century, but his most famous stories by far were those in his book Struvelpeter, in English that roughly translates to shock-headed Peter, and when you look at the cover illustration, you can see why. But the merry stories and the fun pictures this book promises are actually gruesome lessons in etiquette. The story of Struvelpeter himself, for example, is about a young boy who never bathed, cut his nails, or combed his hair, but the punishment for his slovenly appearance was incredibly cruel. Quite bluntly, Peter was unloved by everyone around him. I guess this helped German mothers convince their kids to bathe, but was the threat of eternal loneliness really necessary? Well, kids, make sure you have good personal hygiene or no one will ever love you. Good night. Little Suck a Thumb Another of Hoffman's horrifying Struvelpeter stories is Little Suck a Thumb, which is, without a doubt, the most gruesome tale in the entire book. It follows a young boy called Conrad, who, despite his mother's requests, won't stop sucking his thumbs. She warns him that a terrifying figure called the Tall Tailor will come to cut off his thumbs if he doesn't stop, but he doesn't listen. So the gangly figure of the Tall Tailor turns up with a terrifyingly large pair of scissors and makes good on his mother's promise by cutting off both of the boy's thumbs. You'd think the mother would be distraught considering a creepy man just mutilated her son, but no, she effectively says Conrad just got what he deserved. The end. This terrifying tale was clearly designed to scare young children into breaking their thumb-sucking habits back in the 19th century, but it's so horrifying by modern standards that it actually served as inspiration for Tim Burton's disturbingly gothic film Edward Scissorhands, although I wouldn't want to suck on those thumbs if I were you. The Crybaby now, Hoffman didn't just write morbid moral stories for a German audience. His book Slovenly Betsy was marketed to parents in the United States as the American Struvelpeter. And unfortunately for American kids, it was just as horrifying. One story was written about a young girl who just wouldn't stop crying. Her mother berates her for tearing up unnecessarily and warns her that if she keeps crying, she'll go blind. That's some questionable parenting right there. Understandably upset by her mother's words, the girl keeps crying until she notices her eyesight is, in fact, getting worse. Scared and confused, she gets even more upset, but suddenly she realizes it's not tears dripping from her eye socket, but her actual eyes. She literally cries her eyes out. Well, the story ends with Hoffman telling kids to try and be cheerful all day and just not cry. That's right, kids. Swallow that sadness and plaster on a smile, or your eyes will drip out of their sockets like big, gooey marshmallows. Phoebe Ann, the Proud Girl Another horrendous Hoffman story from Slovenly Betsy follows this unfortunate-looking girl called Phoebe Ann. Although with those big-headed proportions, she looks more like a smug mushroom than a young girl. Anyway, Phoebe Ann's supposed sin is having too much pride. She sticks up her nose all the time, thinking she's better than everything and everyone around her. 
so much so that she won't even look at the ground. But she holds her head so high that it begins to stretch her neck out freakishly until she's left looking like a giraffe. And she still refuses to look down. That's until her neck becomes too weak to support her head, and she's forced to push her noggin around on a wagon for the rest of her days. I'm no scientist, but I'm fairly certain that just holding your head up doesn't cause your neck to stretch like taffy. The Little Glutton Snacking, grazing, and boredom eating are all habits that are really hard to break. But if you do find it hard to put down the snacks, you'll probably empathize with the next poor kid that horrendous old Hoffman wrote about. In a story called The Little Glutton, there's a young girl called Mary who just can't stop snacking. She sneaks food from the pantry morning, noon, and night. And even though she's told off by her mother, she just can't stop eating. Until one day, she spots some beehives and has the bright idea to stick her hand in and scoop out the delicious honey. Apparently, no one taught Mary that messing with bees is a bad idea and she's immediately swarmed by the entire hive. Stung from head to toe, she's bedridden for weeks and, in a weirdly cruel move by her parents, is only fed medicine. But this apparently puts a stop to her constant need to eat, meaning she's cured. Although, cured might be the wrong word here. How about traumatized or scarred for life? The Green Ribbon The story of the green ribbon is nestled inside a kid's book called In a Dark, Dark Room and Other Scary Stories by Alvin Schwartz. Well, this doesn't sound ominous at all. The tale starts off innocently enough with a little girl named Jenny who makes friends with a boy called Alfred. He notices that Jenny always wears a green ribbon around her neck, and when he asks her why she wears it, she answers cryptically, Someday, I'll tell you. The two grow up, fall in love, and get married. But despite Alfred's constant questioning, Jenny never reveals why she wears the ribbon. That is, until one day when she gets very, very sick and is told by the doctor that she is dying. Nice, light theme for a children's book there. So she beckons Alfred to her side and tells him he can finally untie the ribbon. But when he does, his wife's head tumbles to the ground. It turns out he's been married to a headless zombie all these years. Now, first of all, what the hell, Jenny? You tricked Alfred into marrying an undead corpse? That's horrific. And as for Alfred, how did he never notice that his wife's head was loose? If it was only being held on by a ribbon, surely he must have seen her adjust it once or twice. Did he really not notice? Or maybe he was just into that kind of thing. Ugh. Coraline Many of you probably know Coraline as the stop-motion fantasy film released back in 2009. But this story actually started out as a kid's book written by Neil Gaiman, an author renowned for his nightmare-inducing writing. And even though it's a children's book, Coraline is no exception to this. For those who don't know the story, it features a young girl named Coraline who moves into a new house with her family where she finds a mysterious tiny door. It leads to a parallel universe where the food is amazing, the adults pay attention to her, and she essentially has everything she could ever want. The only disturbing difference is that the people in this world all have buttons for eyes but for some reason this doesn't bother her. That is, until she learns about the price she must pay to stay in this world. She too has to sew buttons into her eyes. Ugh. And when she refuses, as anyone in their right mind would, she's kidnapped and trapped with the ghosts of three button-eyed children who once clearly took the deal. It turns out that the main villain, called the Beldum, quickly gets bored of the children it traps, leaving them to starve. But Coraline eventually outsmarts the Beldum and escapes, removing its right hand in the process. Now, I'm all for scary kid stories, but the sheer amount of mutilation in this tale is terrifying. And on top of that, I think I just developed a fear of buttons. Goosebumps True 90s kids will remember the sleepless nights reading a Goosebumps book would bring. This series was created back in 1992 by children's author R.L. Stein, 
But his empire of family-friendly terror contained some seriously questionable tales. Uh, let's start with Night of the Living Dummy, which follows two old, creepy-looking ventriloquist dummies that are picked up by a pair of twin girls. While the twins argue over who the better ventriloquist is, one of the puppets comes to life. But he claims the two girls are now his slaves and tries to choke the family dog. Like puppets weren't creepy enough already, the girls eventually destroy him, but for a kid's book, the sinister overtones of slavery and animal cruelty are pretty unsettling at any age. Although several other Goosebumps books take horror to much weirder depths, like the painfully punny Bad Hair Day. It tells the story of a kid who wants to learn magic, so he steals a box of tricks from his favorite magician. But to his horror, one of them accidentally turns his sister into a rabbit. Ashamed, he seeks out the magician to turn her back, only to discover that the real magician is a talking rabbit who got cursed by a sorcerer long ago. The rabbit then offers the boy a chance to be in his new act, but when the boy accepts, can you guess what happens? Yep, he too is turned into a fluffy white rabbit. Uh, personally, I don't see what's so scary about being turned into a rabbit, unless you're allergic to carrots. But it gets even weirder and stickier in the Choose Your Own Adventure book, Beware the Purple Peanut Butter. In it, you, the reader, are playing hide and seek when you get hungry and decide to snack on some weird purple goo you found in an old refrigerator. But the strange slime suddenly shrinks you down, and you're faced with being locked in the icebox, being flushed down the toilet, or fighting a big mouse. I think I'd take the mouse over the toilet any day. How about you? Somehow, the series gets even stickier in the Monster Blood Saga. These books follow the evil trail of a thick, sentient slime as it consumes everything in its path, including people and animals. It also has the power to turn animals like hamsters into ferocious gorilla-sized goons. And it even becomes an aquatic military superweapon that multiplies when it's exposed to water. Ugh, yikes. I wouldn't want to be sat on that toilet when they attack. But the creepy crown jewel of the Goosebumps series has got to be the curse of Camp Cold Lake. If not for that disturbing cover art alone, it follows a young girl who really, really hates summer camp, mainly because there's someone watching and stalking her every move. One by one, her campmates meet awful, deadly fates until one day she does too. Like trying to get kids to go to camp wasn't hard enough already. Scary Stories to Tell in the Dark Almost a decade before Goosebumps started offing children with creepy dummies and mysterious purple goo, Alvin Schwartz wrote a children's book that makes full-grown men cry for their mommies. Scary Stories to Tell in the Dark is a collection of 82 truly terrifying tales, which you can tell just by looking at that cover art. It was all powered by Stephen Gamble's ghastly illustrations, which were nightmarishly unforgettable, like those in the classically unnerving story of Harold. It begins with two farmers innocently building a scarecrow that they name Harold, but they begin to use him as an outlet for their anger. They do horrible things to the scarecrow, although, unbeknownst to them, Harold has actually turned into a very vengeful human being. And what's his payback? Why, he skins the farmers and spreads them out to bake in the sun, of course. Ugh. Although, if you thought that was grisly, it's nothing compared to the haunted house. This story starts off with a preacher spending a night in a house where no one has ever stayed because it's supposedly haunted. He begins to hear footsteps when, all of a sudden, this haggard ghost of a woman wanders in and nearly frightens him to death. Well, <laughs> I won't spoil the ending for you, and by which I mean after seeing that, I'm, I'm too scared to finish the story. With those illustrations, these tales are just too disturbing to read in the day, never mind in the dark. Which of these books do you think should be banned from the kids' section of the library? Have you read any others that still give you nightmares to this day? Let me know down in the comments below, and thanks for watching.